Good morning. Today we're continuing our question and answer series. I have a few questions that were submitted. If you have other questions, you are welcome to ask after we finish this question. You can ask questions on any other topic. So the question that we're going to deal with today is what happens if you keep Shabbat but the family that you live in, your parents, your siblings, your roommates, they don't keep Shabbat. What do you do in such a case? What potential issues arise and how to deal with them? So, to, as an introduction, um, we have to remember that we are not terrorists. <laughs> and uh, even though we believe in something, it uh, is not proper to terrorize others and to force them to do what we feel is right. And being that we are not terrorists. When we become religious, we cannot um, disrespect people, we cannot look down on them, and, and uh, we cannot force them. The, the human being was created free, with freedom of choice, and um, it's only counted as a, uh, fulfilling a commandment, a mitzvah, if a person does it willingly. If you force somebody, but really deep inside he doesn't want to do it, so he didn't come close to Hashem, maybe the opposite. Maybe because you force them, now they have a distaste, they don't like, and, and, and they, they associate whatever you're trying to convince them to do, they, they associate it with pain and being forced. So you're not doing them a service by screaming at them, by disrespecting them, or, or by physically forcing them. Um, we don't do forced conversions. We don't force people to do anything they don't want, because again, it doesn't count for them as a mitzvah if they really don't want to do it. Um, and the experience shows that the opposite, people usually become distant and afterwards it's much harder for them to come back to it because they have a, a bad feeling about it and they, they're traumatized. So knowing this, when a person becomes observant, it's mainly his responsibility. He has to learn, he has to keep the laws and he has to be a, a good example to others. Of course, where possible, he should inspire people, he should educate people, he should remind people, but it, was, it should always be done pleasantly, with, with uh, happiness, um, in a friendly manner, never looking down on the person, never screaming at him, and never uh, forcing them. So when we, we, we live with parents or siblings that are not observant and as much as we would like them to also experience the, the beauty, the happiness of uh, keeping mitzvot and being close to Hashem, but we have to keep in mind that the, the, the slower we go, the, the, the more nice we are to them, the more likely they will consider our words, more likely they will pay attention to what we're saying and not block us. So again, we have to make sure that we don't do any um, averot, any sins. We have to make sure that in our observance we do everything correctly. If we can help others, we should. But our main, main um, objective here is to do everything correctly and to foresee, to predict what problems may arise and to solve them before they come. So, of course, Shabbat, even, so, even in a family that is uh, completely observant, requires a lot of preparation. And in a family where only one person is observant and now the whole load is on him, he has to cook, he has to turn all the lights and timers and 
do everything, it's, it's, it's very difficult. So um, it's very important to develop this feeling of mutual respect. To speak to your parents and you, to your siblings and to, to, to ask them, let's be nice to each other. I will respect you and I will not push you to do anything you don't want to do. But please, at the same time, respect me for who I am, a human being with, that, that made my choices. And please don't try to force me not to be observant. Please don't try to trip me up and, and cause me to sin. Please be um, understanding and, and respectful. And once you develop that respectful relationship, it's going to be much easier. Um, and you have to keep your part of the deal. You cannot force them. You cannot look down on them. And this way they will be on your side and they will help you. And they will actually tell you, oh, you cannot do this. This is not for you. They, they will uh, protect you. And this, this way they will be exposed to your keeping Shabbat. They will be observing you. They will be helping you to do it. And this way it will be more likely that they will one day also keep Shabbat. Um, and therefore, you have to make it as easy as possible. For you, for yourself, can keep any humrot that you want, any stringencies that you want, but any time it touches another person, now you have to say, if I take upon myself a stringency, how will it affect those around me? And therefore, if there is a lenient opinion that allows me to do things on Shabbat that way, and it will be easier for my parents and my siblings, then I should, I should follow that. And Bezdat Hashem, when, when I have my own family, my own household, then I can keep uh, the higher standard. And by the way, this is not only at home, this is um, everywhere where you interact with others. You cannot, we say, you cannot be a tzaddik at someone else's expense. If you want to fulfill a mitzvah according to a higher standard, but because of that you're going to hurt someone else, then it's not worth it. You should do the average, you should do just the minimum, but, but uh, don't disturb anyone else. For example, when a child goes to yeshiva, and the yeshiva, let's say it's Ashkenazi yeshiva, and the child is Sephardi, so we keep uh, Beit Yosef meat, and the yeshiva doesn't. We keep uh, Bishul, uh, Beit Yosef, Bishul Israel, Beit Yosef, and they don't. So we say to a child, uh, right now you're in yeshiva, right now <coughs> you're in a, in a situation where keeping that standard will make it difficult for yeshiva. Now they'll have to buy more expensive meat, now they'll have to hire another uh, helper in the kitchen to, to cook it according to uh, Sephardi standard. And you cannot make others, you cannot make other, cause others uh, suffering or financial loss for your stringency. So we tell the child, wait until you graduate, wait until you get married, then you will keep your laws. But as long as you are in an Ashkenazi yeshiva, of course, as long as it's a, uh, they serve glad kosher and everything is fine, according to a strict Ashkenazi standard, then we're lenient and we allow the child to eat there while he's dependent on the yeshiva. Yes. Okay, let's say the child is now a teen and goes out with his Ashkenazi friend. And so what's... The yes, of course. Also now, also when, also when he is not dependent on yeshiva and he's paying for his own lunch, then he has to keep the, the higher standard. And if they go to a restaurant, he has to order what's kosher for him. Mm. Whether it's uh, chicken instead of meat, or parv instead of dairy, whatever, whatever his halacha is, that's what he has to hold. But when someone else is serving him, we don't uh, put our stringencies on them. Um, and, and, and by the way, we mentioned this last week, so I'll just repeat it. We have similar thing about uh, Beit Yosef and Yashan. Even when you are already adult, but you visit someone for Shabbat uh, meal, you don't ask them. Whatever they give you, meat or pastry, you just eat. 
be, uh, as I explained in last class, that because we have a double a doubt and it's for mitzvah, for Shabbat meal, we don't cause uh, issues, we don't tell people what kind of meat is it, um, you, you just go and eat, it's, it's, it's okay. For yourself, you keep a, a higher standard. Yes. Could that also go for Chol of Israel, for the, for the dairy? If you're at someone's home and you want to keep Chol of Israel and you're with people that don't hold by that and they serve milk and coffee, if it's a dairy meal. For Sephardim, it doesn't apply. There are some opinions that say that even for Chol of Israel, if you are in a place where Chol of Israel is not available, mm -hmm. then you're allowed to drink regular milk. But we say that it should only uh, be allowed for children. For adults, since it's okay if you don't add milk to your coffee, you can survive. It's okay if you choose a different uh, breakfast or lunch, something parv, or you choose to forego one kind of food and eat the other. Um, but if it's a dairy meal, you're invited to a dairy meal. Yes. Yeah, so then no, we don't have the same, we don't have the same permission as for uh, um, Yashan and, uh, and Basar Beit Yosef for Chalav Israel. Again, there are those that are more lenient and would allow in case of need to eat Chalav Satam, uh, but generally we, we don't follow that for adults. Yes, as well. There are some Ashkenazim that, that hold Chalav Stam, some hold Chalav Israel, and those that hold, hold Chalav Israel, mostly they're not going to eat in places that are Chalav Stam. But again, both by Sephardim and Ashkenazim, there are those that are lenient and would eat, even adults, if Chalav Israel is not available, they would drink regular milk. <coughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I'm going to stop it, but just for the Beit Yosef stuff. So if somebody who's Sephardi, a woman marries a Ashkenazi man, this is a quick answer. Um, do they stop? Like, is it okay to stop eating bed yourself? Is it okay to stop eating? Um, some uh, 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 the, the halakha in the house follows the husband's customs, and therefore, whatever the original custom of the woman was, she accepts the customs of the husband. If the husband wants to, let's say the, the wife's custom is more strict, and if the husband wants to accept the strict custom, he, of course, can. But if not, then the wife can stop uh, keeping her stricter custom, she can go with a more lenient custom of her husband. Yes. Um, you mentioned that we shouldn't like enforce our lifestyle on those that we live with. Um, is it okay to, like, in a respectful manner, make requests or? or have sure. Them yes. As long. Yes. Yes. As long as there is mutual respect, of course, you can tell them. Not that you have to, but I would be so happy if we eat together. That if we, that we don't have separate kitchens, that I can come and comfortably uh, open the refrigerator and eat everything. It would make my life easy. It would make me happy. Yes. Also along those lines, and if it'll get to explain this for later, but when what happens when somebody's doing something that disrupts your your Shabbat, like someone's playing music really loud? Obviously, you can't say shut it off. But what can you do in those cases when you're like it's really like on a weekly basis? You're like it's Yes, if it's something that happens constantly, better on a weekday, speak to them, again, politely, nicely, showing them how you feel, not telling them anything to do, but just from your perspective, saying that it makes me sad, it makes me um, um, upset, stressed, I would feel so much better if, if uh, it was quieter, can we work something out, can you do it on Motzei Shabbat, can you do it on, on Thursday, any other day, if you do this, I'll do something else for you, if you need help, I'll help you in this. You, you try to work it out uh, without, without forcing, without telling the person what to do, but just expressing your feelings and how bad you feel and how, bet how much better you would feel if they would respect you. And if it would happen on Shabbat and you're just like, oh, is that not allowed? Because That's okay. If, if it's just, just expressing your emotions that you cannot control, uh, that's okay. But then if that's the, you know that that means they're going to shut it off? 
for something like that. You know, if you're doing it intentionally, if once it's on, they shouldn't. If they're playing the violin, then you can say mm -hmm. it, because as soon as you, they stop, it, there's, no, there's no breaking Shabbat. But if they already turned the TV <laughs> on and it bothers you, you cannot tell them turn it off. Everything else like bring, bring, bring on or bring on, I try to keep, like the Shah and Holy Shah, all that stuff, but like this stuff I'm not allowed to put on right now because it's like very hard. And I say it to myself, like whenever, when I get married, I'm going to keep it. But let's say now, okay, I'll get married and I'll keep it, then I'll come to my parents' house with my husband and then what's going to happen? So be? just, j the question is that right now you are at, at your parents' house and you don't keep it yourself and when you get married, you will keep it yourself. Now what happens if you visit your parents? So just like if you're visiting Ashkenazi on Shabbat, mm -hmm. you don't have to ask. Mm -hmm. If you're visiting a Sephardi who doesn't keep sh uh, sh uh, Beit Yosef meat, you also don't have to ask because you still have that same double doubt and it's a Shabbat for a, a, a mitzvah. However, if it's not Shabbat and also since you know your parents and you will be coming there all the time, you can do something about it. You can speak to them and just tell them that now that you got married, you keep higher standard and this is where you buy your meat and it's good quality and it's not so expensive and if they would consider switching as well and they will think about it, maybe it will take a few months or years but eventually they will switch. So until they switch you can eat there but because it is on a consistent basis you should speak to them and try to resolve it. Okay, now, yes. Sorry, going, going back to the TV question. If, uh, if you're a summer camp and they turn on the TV and the TV is in the living room where the table is, you should just sit over the TV? So if you, if you are going to somebody who you know they turn on TV, so first of all, don't go to them. Mm -hmm. Tell them, I would love to come to you, spend Shabbat together, spend a meal together. But... I'm not going to feel Shabbat if you, the TV is on. I'm going to feel awkward. I'm going to feel sad that there is a, a Jew next to me who is desecrating Shabbat. I would be happy to come if you can just, just wait as long as I'm there not to use your phone, not to uh, turn on TV. I don't want to inconvenience you, but if you would do that for me, we can spend Shabbat together. If not, that's fine. I still respect you, I, uh, I'll visit you, visit you on another day. So then it's up to them. If they don't want to bother, they'll say, no, I, I, I don't want to do that. And if they want you to come and they're willing to sacrifice, so then they'll say, yes, fine, I'll, I promise I'm not going to turn it on. So to begin with, ask them. If you're already there and they turned it on, you can tell them, you know, once you turn it on, I cannot ask you to turn it off, but please don't switch the, the channel and don't raise the volume, just keep it like that. And then at that point, try to, to, to finish the meal as fast as you can and, uh, and leave as fast as you can. Right, if they're not Shomer Shabbat, there's another question, can you trust their kashrut? Mm. I'll go to this restaurant that doesn't it's kosher but not really the right hexer. So I didn't want to I wanted I didn't want to offend them or embarrass them or hurt their feelings. So I'm relieved when they don't invite me. But in the event that I am invited to their home, because there's one couple, very sweet couple, and the older couple, they would they wanted to invite me mm. for a yomtum. What would I say? Because I know they don't keep Shabbos. What would I do? How would I how is that done? Politely decline? Right, right. If you can, if you're invited, you, c you can, you, you, and you know you can, you're not going to be able to eat there, and you don't want to embarrass them. 
So then you either say, I'm already invited, thank you very much. Like, like she recommended, I can come over for a cup of tea. But if it's Shabbat, you have to know, are they going to make tea mm -hmm. the right way? So, so better not. But you can say, I can come after the meal and we'll just uh, play a, a game or the talk. Um, also, just one recommendation. Um, you have to understand that a lot of times, like you said, people don't know your level. And they might think that what they're offering you is, is uh, kosher for you. And they'll be surprised when you say no. And they might be hurt. But if you are honest and you show them that you are observant, then you will prevent a lot of uh, problems. For example, for men it's easy. A, a man who doesn't wear kippa, then he'll run into all kinds of uh, issues with ladies, with uh, going to restaurants, and many, many issues. And every time they have to break their head how to get out of it. But the simple thing is just to put a kippah on your head, and that's it. A girl's not going to come bother you. The, your boss is not going to invite you to a non-kosher restaurant. And people are not going to share with you jokes that are not appropriate. Right away, you're going to distance yourself from all these issues. So if you show them the, the, your level, you explain to them, oh, you know, I, and you don't have to do it when they invite you. Just in a friendly conversation, mention it to everybody you meet. Oh, you know what? I'm so happy I finally uh, took upon myself the next level. Now I keep this and this and this. From now on, they cannot invite you. And if they do, if they forget, then you'll remind them. Oh, remember I told you I started keeping Shabbat. I stopped cooking. I stopped driving. I stopped eating uh, in restaurants. So now, now you have uh, an excuse that uh, they will accept without being offended. Okay. I, I keep going story in circles. <laughs> yes, so now uh, coming back to Shabbat. Um, if you are the only person observant in the family, you have one set of issues. There might be another problem where your parents think that they are observant, but they don't know the laws and they do things wrong. So that's another issue. What do you do? For example, they, they make a kiddush for you and they don't do it correctly. So you, you don't fulfill the mitzvah. They make havdalah and it's not right. They do hamotzi and it's not right. What, what do you do? How do you fulfill your own obligation when you're relying on someone else? So we're going to discuss both of this. So let's start with candle lighting. So if nobody lights candles in your house, so then it's an obligation for you, at least one person has to light candles. If somebody lights candles and they do it correctly, then according to Sephardim, we only do one set, and then no one else should light, or they can light without a blessing. So does that mean I'm going to say how many men she lights, or is she just automatic? It's automatic that uh, uh, the mother of the family lights for the whole household. However, if no one lights, then someone else has to light with a blessing. For example, if the wife is busy, then the husband has to light with a blessing. If both of them are not available or both of them don't light, then a child, whether boy or girl, have to light with a blessing. And then they can light any amount the, of candles that they want, either two, just two candles or seven candles, or for every member of the family, one candle. But... It's not a mitzvah just for the mother of the family. Every <coughs> home needs a set of candles. And therefore, no matter what your age is, you have to light with a blessing if no one else is lighting. The next is um, kiddush. Again, two, two issues. If nobody is making kiddush, then you have to make kiddush for yourself. If nobody is eating a meal, then you have to just make a, set a table for yourself, make kiddush for yourself, and if someone else wants to participate, you keep them in mind. Women can make kiddush for men. Children over bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah can make kiddush for their parents. Um, for the candle lighting, um, for the longest time, I mean, for starters, the difference between like 
how you, when you say the bracha and when you lay, right? Mm-hmm. It's part of making the bracha first and then they lay and mm-hmm. not, right? So my mom is like, no, for the longest time we always say the bracha, we always lit first and then we say the bracha. Yeah. So it's like now she started to go back to that and I'm like, okay, for Shalom yeah. I'm not going to say anything to her. Is that okay? Like I just yeah, so the question is, if somebody is following a different custom, do you correct them? So since there are two valid customs in candle lighting, some hold, according to the original custom, that you make the blessing first and then you light, and some hold, like Ashkenazim or like Benish Hai, that you light first and then you make the blessing. Since both are valid, even though ideally we should keep our custom, we don't uh, bother people. So if your mother wants to continue lighting and then making a blessing, you can let her. Um, you yourself, better to first make a blessing and then light. No, you should not be involved in anything while you're mm-hmm. praying or making blessings. Okay. So first make a blessing and then light. Um, so the answer is that if you see somebody is doing something wrong, first find out maybe there is an opinion that allows it. Find out maybe there is a custom like that. And if there is, then you don't bother them. Mm-hmm. Yes. Sometimes I tell when you're lighting, when you see the bracha first, then you're lighting, and it doesn't really turn on right away, then you like, I need to strike again. That's fine. Mm-hmm. Once you make a blessing, as long as you're involved in that mitzvah, it doesn't matter how long it takes. You can strike the match again, you can go search for matches, it's fine. Just make sure that you have uh, everything you need, and if you know this matchbox doesn't work, so have a different one, have a couple, have electric lighter, prepare in advance. But after the fact, if it didn't work, it's okay, as long as it takes, but as long as you're involved in it, the blessing still works. Yes? And then you strike Yes. I heard from somebody else, it doesn't have to be. When we make a blessing, it's for the future. I'm about to do this mitzvah. You don't have to do the mitzvah as you, the opposite. It's better not to do any action while you're saying a blessing. Okay. I strike after make a bracha? Yes. You can do either way. If your match is long, you can light the match first and then make the bracha and then light. If you have short matches, then you can strike afterwards. Let's say you lit, you said the bracha, you were lit, whatever, whatever, you said your stuff, and then after you're done, you remove your hands from your eyes and your candles burn out. What do you do? Yeah, what do you do? Yeah, what? Do so one, what? once you make a blessing and you light candles, you accept Shabbat on yourself. Mm-hmm. Afterwards, if the candles go out, you cannot relight them unless there's someone else in the house who didn't accept Shabbat yet, then you can ask either your child or your husband to light the candles again without a blessing. Yes, yes. As long as it's not Shabbat yet, you can ask another Jew to do whatever you need. Until sunset. Yeah, yeah. Usually we light 18 minutes before sunset, and then until sunset for 18 minutes, you can ask anyone to help you who didn't accept Shabbat yet. Yes. So with the whole 18 minutes leniency, if you, you know, like forgot to put a light or something, do you light the candle first and then go put that one on? Or no, the, the 18 minutes is not the leniency. Ideally, we light 18 minutes before sunset, before Shkia. But if for some reason you uh, didn't, you still have those 18 minutes to work with. And so as long as it's not sunset yet, you can still do things. And then you light, then you light. right. Unless you have someone else and you can ask them, I'm going to light just to make sure that the candles are lit. And can you please do other things that are necessary? Or you have to say, I'm not accepting Shabbat with my lighting, and then you light, but you can still do things because you said you're not accepting Shabbat. It's okay if a person lights at home, and then they, they don't make the bracha yet because they just want to have, like let's say my grandma comes over sometimes and she, she knows that she's not going to make it home and back in time or whatever, she's going to be sleeping at home. 
So she lights it on, but she doesn't make the bracha, and she comes to our house and she says the bracha on our family. No. She either can make a blessing on her candles uh -huh. and just keep in mind that she's not accepting Shabbat. With the bracha? Yeah. Okay. But in such a case, she should make sure she goes back before the candles burn out because she needs to benefit from the candles on Shabbat. Either put longer candles or come back earlier. If she cannot do it, then she just lights it without a blessing. Else? Yeah. Why? She lit the candles. She just cannot say a blessing. Okay. And still, uh, okay. Yes. And, and, and in such a case, ask your mother to keep your grandmother in mind mm -hmm. so that at least she'll participate in, uh, in the candle lighting at home. She can light with a blessing, but then your mother will not be able right. to make so a blessing. Yeah, only one person makes a blessing per house. Um, so just to go back, you said you could light a candle and then you have to come back home from the guest house before the candle is... Before the candle burns out, you have to benefit from it on Shabbat. When you left, it wasn't Shabbat yet. Oh, no, let's so say if you leave after Shabbat, like if you just walk into someone's house. Oh, that's fine. As long as after sunset you benefited from the candles, mm -hmm. that's fine. You don't have to come back uh, again. Any, any benefit. That's for Hanukkah candles, no? Mm -hmm. uh, the Hanukkah candles. Yeah? I mean, I don't know. Maybe not. <laughs> I'll look into it, but I, I, I didn't hear of the time limit. And uh, last question. What if my daughter is lighting a candle with me? So, um, yeah, if, if you want your daughter to light or she wants to light, mm -hmm. you light first with a blessing. She says amen. And then she lights without a blessing. So then, yeah, if, if you want to help her, then keep in mind that I'm not going to accept Shabbat until I finish helping my daughter to light. Mm -hmm. So I would still say my blessing? Yeah, you can still say your blessing first. You can light your candle, mm -hmm. and then you help her, but you say I'm accepting Shabbat only after we finish with the whole okay. candle lighting ceremony. That's before you, you finish that, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Three years of age, that with the girls with the candle lighting, they then lit it. It's called, but like with Sephardim, it's not like that. But what if, let's say, you have girls and they're interested and they want to light with you, but you teach them, right? Like it's, it's a whole beautiful experience. Them, you you know? teach so them, yes. You, can, you teach them. Blessing, you can help if them they want to say a blessing just to learn, they're allowed to, but only until bat mitzvah. Mm -hmm. Once they turn bat mitzvah, they can no longer make a blessing. Yes, yeah, so when you go on Shabbatons, whether it's in a house or in a hotel, same thing. Only one person can light in a room. And it has to be a room either that you sleep in or eat in. So if somebody already lit in a dining room, then the second lady cannot make a blessing. So you appoint somebody to make the blessing. Everybody stands, says Amen, and then everybody lights their own candle. Or you give them money, uh, a quarter, they buy th w the candles themselves, and then you are partners with them. So, I just want to ask them, you're not going to make a million women say, like, oh, by the way, only one person has to, like, it's a hotel. Like, there's, like, like right, there's so right, there, are, there could be hundreds of women, but for Sephardim, they cannot. So, I, can you make it in your hotel room? It's gonna, like, cost in a hotel room, what's recommended is to have a flashlight that uses the original uh, light bulb that, that has a filament that he heats up and uh, you, s you can make a blessing and you turn the flashlight on, you put it and then it's going to go out by itself when the battery dies. So that's, that's kosher. Um, where do you get this flashlight? You can probably get it online, maybe oh, from so China. Flashlight. <laughs> any flashlight, oh. it can even be a little, uh, probably if it's an old style light 
uh, bulb, it's not going to be a small battery because it uses energy. But I'm sure you can still find, and it's probably not expensive, and you can buy a few and, uh, and then uh, use it every Shabbat. I mean, you can reuse it, just use a new battery every Shabbat because the battery is going to be dead. Right, so you go to your room, you make a blessing, and you light the, the flashlight. I had, but, like, so, but what if I'm not going to do that, so then I'm not like... You rely on your mother. Then. No, but I'm saying like... Let's no, your mother is not there. No, this is for the house that you're in now. But this is a temporary, you're not... not Still, you, but you have. You don't really have obligation to light candles because somebody else is lighting. And that's why you cannot make a blessing. Are we all not Yotze because we do it in like this one room? You don't have to be Yotze. When there is a light already, you don't need to light. Okay. So you don't have the obligation. And that's why you cannot make a blessing. And if you do make a blessing, it's going to be blessing in vain. And therefore, you shouldn't do it. You can light, but don't make a blessing. Ask your Ashkenazi friend to make a blessing. You'll say Amen. No, I'm and you. Right. So ask someone else to make a blessing for you. Say Amen. If the Ashkenazim, yes. If the Sephardim, not. So that's why I could benefit from the Ashkenazi person to just have me in mind? Yes. Also, the electric lights, if you keep in mind, they also fulfill this obligation. The, the obligation is that there should be light on Shabbat in your home. So that's why if you don't have a candle or in your, your in a hotel or in a hospital where you, they don't allow it, you can just light electric light and keep in mind this is going to be my Shabbat light. So walk out of the room, the electrical Shabbat, turn on the light, walk You don't have to, to go out of the room, you just turn the light off. Okay, let's see, whatever I'm saying. Okay. You make the blessing and you turn the light on, but it's not going to work with LED lights, only uh, old style lights. So... Because uh, the their old style light bulb, incandescent light bulb, it works in a similar way as a candle, that it produces light from heat, okay. whereas LED there is no heat and um, fluorescent also it's questionable, but but the regular bulb where electricity flows through and it heats up the the the, the metal s strand, and from being so hot it produces light which is very similar to fire. So for that, we can make a blessing. So let's say we don't know, like, can we rely on the LED if we don't know? Like if you don't know, just turn it on with intent that this should be your Shabbat lights and don't make a blessing. Mm. Okay. Um, now, next is Kiddush. We said that you have to make your own Kiddush, but what if somebody is making Kiddush? your father, your grandfather, your great-grandfather, they're making Kiddush and you know they're making a mistake. They don't have enough wine in their cup, they use a tiny little cup, less than three ounces, or they don't know how to say the words and the words come out wrong, or they swallow words or they skip words or they say so fast that most likely they skipped a lot of the words. So, or they don't know that they need to keep you in mind so in such a case, you should have either your own cup of grape juice or wine and quietly say the words of Kiddush to yourself. And then when they're done, you just drink your own. This way you don't embarrass them um, and you make sure you, that you fulfill the obligation. But if, let's say, they will not allow you to have your own wine because they say, I make the bracha and then I give you, so then you just look at their wine if assuming they have enough in their cup and if they don't then at least uh, look at the bottle and <laughs> and you make the and you make the blessing for wine and you make the blessing for kiddush and then you drink later but in such a case you need to drink uh, uh, preferably three ounces or majority of of of, of three ounces No, afterwards you'll pour for yourself. Uh, uh, okay. Chick fool is yeah. the majority of three, uh, three ounces. Okay, so I have a question. So, yesterday, like, I was on a journey myself, and we had like family over that was a 
lot from them, and like they, I didn't know how they're gonna see the kiddush. I took the kiddush from, from myself, and I went to my grandpa. Give me the kiddush. They know how I am. So he gave the kavod to his brother-in-law, and he is a lot from her. And I was like, just in case, I was like, I don't know what to do. So he was saying the kiddush, and I was listening. He said it very well, mm -hmm. but it's still just in case. I'm like, well, what if he makes a mistake? And I wasn't really sure if I was having kavana that he was covering me. At the end of the day, I couldn't even like say my kiddush, and this is embarrassing. And I just said very for I guess and I took from his kiddush and that's the uh, amyote because I wasn't really like having kamana that he's covering me but at the same time he did say it well like did that Yeah uh, we, we don't suspect the worst. We don't expect the worst. We always expect good and we only fix things when we know they're broken. Okay. Which means if you don't know that something wrong happened, assume that everything is fine. If whoever is saying it, he's saying it correctly, right. so then you don't worry. You rely on them. If you had negative intent that you don't want to be Yotze. Sure, like at the end of the day, I don't know how, how I was going to end up at like the end of it. And I even didn't even hear, like, I missed how I said Bore Pere like I missed that part. Okay, so Bore Pere Geffen, you said for yourself. Right. Everything else, you you listen and uh, you're Yotze. Mm, okay. um, that's the, the best. Assume that things are well unless you know for sure they're not. So again, you see that there's not enough wine, you see that he's, you, that he's uh, skipping words, that he doesn't know how to pronounce words, mm -hmm. then you do it yourself. Otherwise, you, you assume everything is good. Um, was it Friday night or Shabbat day? Oh, Shabbat day. Yeah, so Shabbat day is more lenient because Shabbat day Technically, you only need to say Bore Priya Geffen anyway. Everything else is a uh, bonus. Okay. So Shabbat day is for sure, you don't have to worry. If anything, you can just say Bore Priya Geffen for yourself. On the one that he was giving out already from his comments. Yes, Bure yeah. I just wanted to clarify the three levels. So the first level is that you say you hold it and you're saying the whole Kiddush for yourself. And you're like, is it okay if you're like, or yes. you actually say it? You have to, to like preferably, like yeah, preferably you have to hear your own words. But the Avad, as long as your lips are moving, even though you didn't hear yourself, you're Yotzeh. Alright, then the next option, I'm sorry, is just to look at somebody's, while they're saying it, am I still like whispering it in my head? Yes, you're still whispering in your head, looking at, or looking at the no, bottom. whispering with your, like but no. like not out loud, like just quietly right. whispering. Yeah, and then the third one is I'm looking at the bottle and I'm saying it, but then immediately after he passes around the, the wine and you take a sip and then you're like, okay. Yeah, like he's no, no, if he's holding it in his hand, you keep in mind. And once you make a blessing, it covers everything. But if you didn't have enough, let's say. Because Fine, the bottle, then you keep everything in mind. The bottle also. <laughs> um, and, and, then you, and then before you drink, you're like, where can I get from? And you say, like, you have to say, yeah, but you already said where can I get from? Yes. Like or get for yourself a cup that is... Uh, not see-through, a paper cup or a regular porcelain cup, pour for yourself in the kitchen uh, grape juice and then just hold it without <laughs> anyone noticing. Does the cup have to be full always <laughs> for, for Kiddush? Because I know some people, they like put to, like, to here and like... It's That's okay, as long as or? it looks a full cup. Mm -hmm. By Kiddush, it doesn't have to spill over. Mm -hmm. Only by Havdal, it has to spill over. So, if you put as long as it looks like a full cup, it doesn't have to be till the, the top. At all. No, you need to drink only majority of the uh, three ounces, which means an ounce and a half and a little bit more, which is, we say, a chick full. So you just take one sip, cheek full, and, and that's it. I have a question. So remember how you said for Havdalah, if a person is skipping Havdalah, not saying it right, but the last bracha they say, and like they say, fine, you're Yotze. Let's say for Kiddush, the same thing. They're skipping words. What are they saying? What should they be saying correctly? So for Friday night, what is the most par important part of Kiddush? Yeah. Is when you start the Bore uh, Priya Gefen. From Bore Priya Gefen, and then the next bracha, Ansher Kiddushan Bamitzvotav, these two blessings you need to hear and they need to be said correctly. 
the first paragraph, Yom HaShishi, if somebody spoke, if somebody mispronounced, that's okay. And then following that bracha, that may or may not be 100%, and then there's like the family members and everyone says, Amen, they get like, are you allowed to say Amen? Or should you say Amen? Yeah, because you're like <laughs> saying your own bracha, can you say Amen? No, if you're saying your own bracha, you shouldn't say Amen, because you cannot interrupt. Yes, the, the, the Seuda most important is Shabbat day, but the Kiddush most important is Friday night. That's the main Kiddush. Yes. Yeah, I, I, since saying Kiddush means is, is announcing that now is Shabbat and we keep Shabbat, Shabbat is holy, and if a person doesn't keep Shabbat, it's like he's lying. Um, he, he's not saying it seriously. He doesn't believe in it. So it's better that somebody who keeps Shabbat so should make the Kiddush. That's another reason that if somebody, even if he's saying all the words correctly, but it's better if you yourself say it. Okay, next is what do we do with Havdalah? Havdalah at the end is also obligation for both men and women and if nobody in your family does Havdalah you have to do it yourself. If somebody is doing it incorrectly you have to do it yourself. Um, the main part of Havdalah is the last blessing. So as if you came late as long as you heard the last blessing you're Yotze and uh, the, the last blessing is the actual Blessing of Havdalam, Hamavdil bin Kodesh Lechot. But let's say you didn't hear the beginning of the summer, you didn't do the Ha'esh, you're still Yotzeh? You're still Yotzeh, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Afterwards, if you want, you can make your own blessings. Mm -hmm. um, but the Havdalah, you're Yotzeh with the last blessing. And yes. By Havdalah, we, we try to drink three ounces so that you can make after blessing. Uh, ala gefen. By Kiddush we don't need it because we're going to say Birkat Amazon, that's why you don't need three ounces. By Havdalai, preferably you should drink three ounces. If you didn't drink three ounces, then you don't make the after blessing. The, the Havdalai you still fulfilled, even if you didn't drink. Does it have to be wine or grape juice? Would be in your drink, right? Or Ideally it should be wine and grape juice. If there is no and you don't have ability to get, then you can use other drinks like beer. It has to be an important drink. For Kiddush, Shabbat morning Kiddush, we're lenient. You can use milk, right, milk, coffee. Shabbat day, if you're allergic to sugar or grape juice or you cannot tolerate the alcohol, so then you can use coffee or, or milk or juice uh, for Kiddush. Havdalah should be wine or grape juice. In the worst case, it can be beer or other drinks that are important drinks. The, uh, but again, nowadays, mm, we, we do have wine, grape juice, and even if we don't, we can borrow from a neighbor or just go to a store. Uh, we're talking about uh, somebody who has no way of getting grape juice. Nowhere. He, there's no store, no neighbors. He himself doesn't have. Then you use another drink like beer. Yeah. Years ago, I was with people that didn't have wine and they used vodka to finish the finish. Oh, and then we, <laughs> we poured the vodka on the flame and it was like a torch. Oh, <laughs> Havdala. So, for Havdala. Oh my gosh. So, did they have, could, could they have extinguished the flame with something other than the vodka? Or they had to use Yeah, it can, be, <laughs> it can be anything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So, he could have just used. Okay, thank you. Is the whole the thing with the kid in the thing after, is that like an obligation? It's not obligation, it's a nice thing. Okay, we'll have to do it. Right. right. But why so do we put the candle inside the, like, what's the rationale behind that? <laughs> no, you need to put it out. We don't, generally, we don't blow out candles. It's not a good sign. Okay. Not a good sign to blow out candle with your breath. Oh, wow. um, so, so you... Right, 
birthday also. Not. Okay. No, you. Right, right. Let's quickly do kiddush. Okay. Let's quickly make kiddush. Okay, but let's say there's compote in my like the same thing with bugs, and like my mom makes the compote, and there's like fruits in there that could have bugs and whatever, and they tell me give me the compote, give me the whatever. Am I allowed to give it to them? That's different because you don't know. Assuming she cleaned it, assuming she washed it. That's like a subject I can right, 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 right. Okay. Um, why do we like, use the, the wine to, to, to bring the holiness of Shabbat into the week, work week, and uh, to remind ourselves that, that we just came out of Shabbat? Ideally, after every Shabbat, we should grow, we should become closer to Hashem. So, as a sign of that, we bringing the memory of Shabbat with us. Mm -hmm. I feel there's something else. With the bone on the back of the neck, mm -hmm. you see the direction that's going on. Yes, but on again, that's just a reminder. That That's not it. That doesn't keep the bone alive. That just is a reminder uh, that somebody who keeps Shabbat is going to have resurrection. Um, now, next, electric lights. This is a, a, a big topic, and uh, sometimes family members say, oh, I want to save electricity. I cannot allow lights on for the whole night. Yes, so then you get timers, um, and if you can, you get the timer that uh, connects to the light switch. This way, your main lights can be shut off. If not, you get a floor lamp and use that on Shabbat. In the worst case, if they, they still, they don't want timers and they don't want lights on, <coughs> you can use what's now available. It's a little bit more expensive, but what's available is uh, it's called kosher switch. Mm -hmm. Kosher light switch, it's not recommended for a regular household, but in cases of difficulty, when you live with such people that don't want to keep the light on. Then you get a kosher switch for them and maybe you need electrician if you don't know how to install it. And this way, following the instructions, at least they're not going to be breaking Shabbat openly. Um, they're going to be just using a loophole to go around it. But it's not recommended on a regular. It's, it's like a very Yes, only if you have sick people or non-religious people it's recommended, otherwise not. How does it work? The way it works is that periodically it sends a, a beam and it checks if uh, the plastic switch is this way or that way. And uh, it, it has a red light, uh, blue, uh, green light and yellow light and uh, when it's green that means it's deactivated and you can switch the plastic whichever side you want because mm -hmm. right now it's off. And then a few seconds later it's going to turn yellow to warn you that don't touch and then it's going to go red which means now it's checking what's going on. And at that moment it's going to see that the, the switch was moved and it's going to turn on or off the lights. So you're not actually doing it yourself because at the time when you're moving it, it's dead. Uh, but still, for children, for others, and for yourself, it, 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 it is confusing. They see that you are using uh, the light switch, so they're not going to understand is it Shabbat or weekday. But in cases, if you have a sick person, elderly or not religious person, so you can, you, you can use it. Yeah, if you if if you the first time when you walk on the street and <coughs> light goes on, it's okay. You can continue, but if you know already where it is, you should either go on the other side of the street. 
still. Yes, more and more it's more becoming more complicated. Yeah. Or you try to uh, go more on the street itself or follow somebody who is going ahead and turning them on or wait until the car passes and then the lights go on or walk on a different street, go around the block. You have to try your best. Right, so again, you try to prevent it, you try to go around it. In the worst case, if you have no other choice, you walk. And but, but again, there are more Would lenient opinions. To walk in front of me to do yes, yes, in such a case you can because it happens automatically, so you can actually ask, I can ask, ask somebody. Yes, yes, so my yes. Thing is Yeah, so a camera by itself is okay because you don't uh, see the effect of it. Okay. You don't benefit from it. So on Shabbat, with cameras, you have to cover the monitor or tur turn off the monitor. And even though it's recording, but since you n you, you're not benefiting from it right now, you don't see anything. It's all being recorded digitally. You don't see it. That's permitted. But if there is a monitor, then you look at it and you are benefiting from it. So that's not, no, I mean like not allowed. The, like a red Th that's fine, because again, you're not benefiting. Here, when the light goes on, it actually illuminates your path and there is the tangible thing. benefit mm -hmm. that you're creating. So Here... A little red beam goes off every time you walk by that sign, right? Right, that's okay. You have to do your best. You don't have to actually walk in the middle of the street, but maybe on a on a curb, on the side of the sidewalk, not not uh, on the actual sidewalk. Sometimes they have grass in between. Yeah, it still lights up on the, on the grass. So then, if possible, you walk on the other side of the street and you go all around, and then you cross the street, or you go around the other side of the block. They open. They o they, There's always. Yeah. It's like zigzagging. It's a problem. It's a problem. So again, if possible, um, walk behind somebody who turned it on already. There's nobody there. It's quiet. Check if a car passes by. Maybe it's going to go on. Or just check the car is not there and then go fast. J again, try your best. In the worst case, of course, you don't have to sleep on the street. You can, <laughs> you can go... You can go and, and, and again try to prevent these things from happening. Try to um, avoid going out at night. You know, if you have to visit somebody, go for lunch. Yes. There's, um, there's no leniency that if there's more than a certain amount of people, if there's more than two or three people, that. There is such a leniency, yes, that if you have more than one person and they do a job that requires only one person, so it's as if each person does only a little bit, not the full job. So, so if she has all of her kids and her family, right, right. it's technically okay? It's better, yes, okay. it's better for sure. To if if two people do the job of one person, <laughs> yeah, so then it becomes on a, on a lower level. So, for example, let's say you, you, you have a baby and uh, there is no Eruv and the baby starts crying. Until now, she was walking and now she's crying. So, if two people carry the baby at the same time, it's better.
Oh, let's say like the hot water was on because somebody turned it on, and then are you allowed to turn it off and then turn it on the cold water or like? Yes. You're allowed to. Yes, if you already turned on the hot water, you can quickly turn it off and turn the cold water on. Oh, okay. It's not like shutting off the fire or whatever. That no. No. Would you say in a building, is are we allowed to rely on that somebody else turned on and so hot water is okay to use? In the building where majority are not Jewish, uh, that you can use hot water. You approximate. Yes, you're, you're, yes, yes. No, some buildings you know. Right, some buildings you know. All, all my neighbors are Jewish or majority, then, then you cannot. Yes. So what do you do in a house? In a house? Well, you... Yeah, you ideally, ideally, you prepare a basin with warm, soapy water, and every time you bring dishes from the table, you put it there. And then after the meal, they're already soaked in soapy water. Now it's very easy to clean them. But it gets so cold, the water. I tried that one. Fine, you put on gloves, and if necessary, you put first winter gloves, and then you put... <laughs> On top of it, you put uh, uh, rubber gloves, and you wash dishes like that. Also, right, if you don't need it for the next day, don't, don't use it. Also, what helps is to take a um, paper towel or shmata and wipe the plate first from all the, the dirt and then you have much less to, to wash. But it can be wet, right? Yeah, it can be wet. Or some people use a brush or whatever to clean the plate as, as much as you can first. So along those lines, if you're at like, somebody else's house and you want to offer to do the dishes because you know that they're going to use the hot water and the regular sponge, yeah. and let's say you're, used, you're washing, and like the only thing you can wash with is the Shabbat, like, are you allowed to do a sin? to make it less on somebody else? Like, or like the fridge light is on, you know they're going to keep opening the fridge. Are you going to have one moment where you're like, let me just take this light closed? And then like this, like, are there, so you're just supposed to just like keep watching it happen and then like the food that comes out you can eat or like, you know, like there's so much more that... that <coughs> right. Um, let's leave this for next time. <laughs> it's a... Yes. Okay, we're going to stop here. Next time... We're going to uh, mention cooking. If what, what if somebody cooks? What if somebody war warms up food? What if they don't want to use black? What if they don't want to keep the fire on? And so on. Shavuot Tov.